ask you, like, because I, it, it does to me, like you had such a opposite upbringing than I did. And I think yours is infinitely better. And just, it, especially when it comes to sex, like maybe not even about sex, but like, what's one thing your parents did for you that like, you think you want to pass down to your kid? Um, they were really, really strict about grades and, um, a good education. I wasn't allowed to get C's. If I got a C, then I got a tutor, um, until my grades went up. My dad used to also tell me to, and I don't know, maybe this is added to my like body dysmorphia complex, but he also said that he didn't like B's with the big fat round bellies. He liked the tall skinny A's with the top hats. So he would equate like a B, like it, as an average kind of grade that like was overweight and undesirable. <laughs> My parents have a lot of very high expectations on me. That's probably like the one problem that I, w- I will try not to pass on to my children is the, mm-hmm. the high expectations. Um, it's also like you. between LA and porn, it's like you had no shot at having like not body dysmorphia, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah. Though to be fair, it's probably it's not as bad as I think it's. It's not as bad as it could be. I've never been anorexic or anything, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I, do, I feel like I have the same body dysmorphia that like all girls in this city do. Yeah, you know I mean? exactly. It's yeah. like like in that city, it, L.A. It's impossible not to be conscious of your body all the fucking time. Yeah. Like that's just the energy in the city. Yeah. But I would say that, but actually, honestly, more important, like family time was really, really important to them. So as I mentioned, my parents are British. And so there was a tradition that we had every Sunday called Sunday lunch. And this goes back to like going to church and coming back from church and you put a roast in the oven before you went to church and it would cook while you were at church. And then when you would come back, you would have this big like Sunday, uh, kind of early dinner supper with, um, actually supper is supper dinners earlier, I think in England. No, I'm getting <laughs> oh, supper and dinner. There's, no, there's like no lunch. It's like dinner and then supper. Or is it supper? And then I dinner? think tea is one of them, right? Like tea, tea is, is the in between the dinner and the supper. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of breaks, a lot of breaks. Yeah. Um, so, so anyhow, and so every Sunday, like I wasn't allowed to go to the beach with my friends Like I had to stay home and have Sunday lunch, um, you know, with roast potatoes and the whole nine yards with my family. So you had a pretty strict upbringing. I mean, in certain things. Yes, absolutely. In weird ways. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, so hold on. Like, did you, you said porn wasn't always the plan. Like what, what did you want to be like when you were younger? Uh, I wanted to be an English teacher. Cause that was what my dad was before he met my mom and, and started working for her and running her company. So yeah, yeah, I actually went to school. I went to UCLA and graduated with a degree in world literature, like thinking I always loved photography and I loved it throughout high school and I, and I loved it throughout college. Um, and I wanted to be a photographer, but I thought that that wasn't a very responsible career path it wasn't safe. You know, there was a lot of artists out there and you could so easily just not succeed. And like, be that, it's not safe. like it's yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, being an English teacher is like safe and I love literature and, um, teaching people. So that was my idea. And then the internet happened and when the internet happened, so the internet happened and my parents launched Sue's net, my parents' website And they went from, you know, being in a place where like, they were like not doing so great financially and they weren't really sure about their future to suddenly making an obscene amount of money, like Mm -hmm. just pouring in because they, you know, my mom, one of the really smart things that my mom did that I learned from her that has actually been so beneficial for me now in this pandemic is that I always worked for myself and created and owned my own content. Mm-hmm. I have like hollyrandall.com and I have income coming in from that. And I have like, mm-hmm. content I can post on my only fans and like, you know, and I make money in different areas off my own content. I don't, you know, the stuff, obviously I shoot for twisties or for playboy. Mm-hmm. Um, they own it. I can't, they pay mm-hmm. one fee. I never touch it again, but I was always, I always learned from my parents to never put all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, and never rely on one person to be your income. Always 
have some motive of independence. And that's what my mom did. So she owned a lot of the rights to her photos, which a lot of her comp- contemporaries never did. And so mm-hmm. when the internet came along, she had like the largest private library of erotic photography than anybody in the world. And she had this huge name. And so she just started putting her pictures online and it was, you know, and that was back before, obviously you could stream video or anything and people just fucking ate it up. And it was just like, it was crazy. It was just this boom that will probably. And how old were you at that point? You had already graduated college. Uh, Yeah. They launched Suze in 1998. They'd started licensing their content to other websites like Danny's hard drive. I don't know if anybody remembers Uh them. Yes. Um, but they didn't launch their own website because they saw like how much money they were making licensing content. So they launched their own website. I think they launched like a month before Google launched. <sighs> yeah. Like I Google. I remember a world like that. Yeah. Google launched like a month before or a month after my parents launched. And um, yeah, so they were making all this money and my dad was like, <laughs> he goes, cause I was, I was at, um, I was actually at the time I was in Santa Barbara at the Brooks Institute of Photography because I had decided actually to try to become a photographer, but I was going to be a fashion photographer, right? And uh, my dad was like, how would you like to move back home? I'll get you an apartment in Malibu and a Ferrari, you know, because that's how much money they were making. Well, I got to move back into my old bedroom with them and I got a Ford Explorer, but it's fine. (laughs) But you know, who's counting? It's fine, whatever. <laughs> My dad has always been a little bit like extra with his promises. So for you, it was really like a come home work for the family business. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, at the beginning, I really thought I was just going to work in the office and like help them out with admin stuff. I did not think I would start shooting for them. That was not the plan initially. How soon after were you shooting? About six months, I think. Oh, yeah. wow. Because basically what happened was they started running model sites for some of their favorite models. And Amy Sweet mm-hmm. was one of them. And actually mm-hmm. to this day, she's still one of my best friends mm-hmm. and house pet at the time. And we became really good friends because we were the same age. And so I started shooting her for her little website that my parents were running. Oh, and back then, like people, I think most people don't know, but model sites, like at the beginning of the internet were fucking killing it. Killing it. Yeah. Like kind of like OnlyFans is now sort of. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was different, I think, because now OnlyFans is a little bit more normalized, I think. Like, right. Um, And it's also like amateur kind of. Instagram girls are doing it. Um, Yeah. But yeah, so I started shooting her and I just found like, I really enjoyed it. And the freedom, the internet gave my parents the freedom to shoot whatever they wanted. So, and because my mom was always really into like highly stylized glam, we were able to really be creative with the concepts that we came up with. And we had no boss, you know, we had nobody telling us this is the kind of content we need. So we would have these meetings like on Monday, we're like, what are we going to shoot this week? Let's shoot like a forties gangster mobster theme you know, and we had the money to get the car and the fucking stylus and the location yeah. and the set. And, and I mean, literally like anything you wanted to do, we could do. It was so, we could be so creative. And the only thing they had to do was, you know, take off their clothes and like spread their vagina at the end. But otherwise yeah. it was kind of like a fashion shoot. Totally. And, and we were making tons of money and, you know, the adult was it, was what it? Was it like, like- Like, were you, was your mom very like critical? Cause she is, because she's a photographer, like, was she, do you think she was like extra hard on you because you're her daughter? I don't know if she was extra hard on me, but she was definitely critical. I mean, everything I know, I learned from my mom. Yeah. I would remember her pointing out, I would remember her pointing things out to me. And I remember at the time thinking like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not a big deal. And now I totally see it. Ah. You know, like just little like placement of hands and like a little yeah. extra light like in this corner. And I just remember it took me so long to learn what I know now. Um, is it, but is it even, is it knowledge or is it that you've developed like an instinct? I've developed an instinct through learning the knowledge. Yeah. Like, okay. I'm not sure that I would know those things if I hadn't had somebody to guide me and tell me those mm-hmm. things. And then mm-hmm. I could see it. But it's- And totally, now it's like driving. Like it's yeah, just- it's, 
it's totally instinct now. It's funny because it's like photography really is the only thing that I am like never unsure about. Like it's the only like thing in my life that like I don't doubt. Like I know what I'm doing. Like I really know what I'm doing. Everything else, I have no fucking idea what I'm doing. But like I feel so confident behind the camera. It's just uh because you're an expert. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you feel that way about podcasting? Like, do you feel unsure at all? Oh my god, yes. Yeah. I'm podcasting is great. It I is. agree. And I go into most of my interviews like with no prep. I don't know. Really? Why. I'm shocked. No, I, I would have imagined that you are the type and maybe this is just me projecting because maybe I'm just about to tell you what I do. But like, I, I, if I don't, I, I mean, I've never gone into an interview without prep. And if I didn't, I would probably cancel. Really? Because the level of anxiety would just be like through the roof. I think it depends on who I'm interviewing. Like with you, I feel like I know you and I know what we're going to talk about. So I don't feel like I need to worry too much. But um, like, for example, I actually just interviewed a medieval professor who specializes on sex in the Middle Ages. And I had to like prep for that. Um, And by (laughs) prep, I mean, tell her to give me questions to ask her. (laughs) Yeah. Like that's, it's like speaking another language. Like I, I wouldn't even know what words to start using. Like, (laughs) yeah. So I I do, sometimes I go in prepared and, and, and (laughs) the interviews probably go better. I don't know. I think a lot of it is too, because I'm so busy and I'm so busy shooting that I don't really have a lot of time to prep for my podcast the way that I should. I wish that I could cut down on shooting significantly and focus on the podcast more. When you shoot, is it like, is it the opposite? Do you go in with like so much prep? It depends on the client. I mean, twisties, like, you know, Mangi, like they're very specific about what they want. So like I have very specific wardrobe. I have specific key shots I have to get. I, yes. And like a wicked feature. I mean, forget it. You're shooting a feature. You better be fucking prepared. Like I'm 100% prepared for that. Naughty America. (laughs) especially because like they don't really give me much direction or they might tell me the night before like oh shoot a school teacher scenario (laughs) I just fucking wing it I'm just like and who cares you know like they don't care I don't care (laughs) I mean yeah no Naughty America is like it's this is such a hard thing to explain to someone who's not in porn but I'm laughing because it's like not it's not necessarily that like Naughty America is shitty or anything like that it's just like the whole vibe is so different. Like, like certain sets you go on and you get this like thick packet of like what you need to be wearing, what positions you need to be fucking in, what like shot, every single shot that's going to be done. Whereas like Naughty America, like you get there and the director tells you what you're shooting that day and yeah. then that's it. <laughs> yeah. Because I might not even have gotten the scenario until the night before. <laughs> Like it happens all the time. So like, and sometimes I don't get it at all. And I'm just like, fuck it. I will just shoot whatever. They, they'd be yeah. happy. So, I mean, but uh, yeah, I don't go into, um, but here's the strange thing about, and tell me like, if you, if you feel this way as well with your podcast, like it's interesting. Cause some people have asked me, they're like, oh, well, you know, if your podcast ever did really well, do you think that you would maybe stop shooting and focus solely on the podcast? But here's like the thing if I am no longer like working actively in the porn industry, then I'm no longer an insider. And then I'm just some random person interviewing porn stars about something I don't really know that much about. Like, I think what adds value to my show is the fact that I've been in the trenches with these people. We have stories to share. We've been on sets for 18 hours together where like we both broke down and cried. Like all of that experience is what makes the the conversation feel more, um, intimate. Yeah. Intimate and companionable. Yeah. So like, even if I wanted to like sh- being a part of the adult industry and shooting is like such an integral part to me being able to even do my podcast. I couldn't but, agree with you more. Like, that, I how does that work for you? Because you're not really shooting that much anymore, but you're still active in the industry. 
Yeah. Like I'm not shooting anymore. So it's true. Like I'm not, I'm not on set with anyone anymore. Um, really, but because I still work for Pornhub, like I still am around people a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's like a way I'm kind of in touch. And then, you know, like also I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think, you know, because I'm still close with Spiegler, like I, I, I'm still up on like all the gossip. I, I still care about like all the stupid shit. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's like, I, um, I, I still, even though like I'm like living on the East coast, I'm, I'm not shooting all the time. Like it's, I, I still consider myself a part of the porn industry and I don't know that I ever want to not be. Mm-hmm. Um, it's such a important part of like who, like my identity, I think. And also yeah. just like, I, I love the porn and I think you feel the same way. Like, I just love the porn industry so much. Like I, it's, it's such a home to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm like with you, like, I, I don't know that, I don't know that either of our podcasts would work from an outsider. Mm-hmm. I, I think, um, especially because, you know, even as a performer, I can say that like, when I go do an interview with someone else, that's like not in the industry, I am a little bit on guard. I never know like where that person's intentions are coming from, if they're going to edit it to make me look like an idiot. Um, you know, like it's, it, you just never know. Whereas like, I think for us, like we have the benefit of like, the people we're interviewing, like somewhat trust us, right? Yeah. Like we, and we, they can at least at the very least know that we are sex positive. We want to make porn look good. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really valuable. I think to like both of us. I want to ask you, have you ever interviewed anybody, um, that, and interviewed them about anything negative that happened to them in porn and, like, cause you know, there's good and there's bad. Like, how do you manage those kinds of conversations when it doesn't paint such a great picture of the industry? To be honest, I don't know that I've ever been in a scenario where the conversation has taken that direction. I think we've definitely like touched on negative things like say depression mm-hmm. or trauma Um, but not necessarily like really negative industry experiences. And that's like a really good question because I don't know how I would navigate that. I think those are really important stories to be told. Um, but there is a part of me that's like, well, there's so much of that out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Come from me. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What about you? Like, have you had to deal with that? Yes, that's definitely happened. And it's like, I actually had this really kind of pivotal moment. So I interviewed Ginger Banks and, mm-hmm. um, I asked her about the cam girls, um, movie that she did for evil angel. And she had like mm-hmm. a bad experience with it. And basically she told me that, John Stagliano acted in a way towards her that she felt like violated consent boundaries. Right. And I think I wasn't, I don't know if I wasn't expecting it, but you know, I know, and I respect John Stagliano. He's like the father of gonzo porn. Mm -hmm. He's been through a lot in this industry. He's faced obscenity cases. Um, and he's just somebody like he's old school. Like I've always respected him. And so she's telling me this and, you know, I, obviously I believe her, um, but it's a difficult topic for me to navigate because I also don't want to sit here and like, just talk shit about people in the industry, you know, but I want her to know that like her experiences are valuable and they're valid. And so, so she tells that story and then the podcast goes out and then John Stagliano calls me. And yeah. he's like, I want to tell my side of the story. And yeah. I'm like, okay, that's totally only fair. Yeah. Um, and I told Ginger, and Ginger, to be fair, was like, absolutely, he should be able to tell his side of the story. So Ginger, I feel like, handled it in a really mature way. Mm-hmm. But it was so anxiety-inducing for me because I was like, mm-hmm. how do I navigate this conversation? How do I ask him these questions but not 
like, and also too, like, it's a he said, she said situation. Like I wasn't there. I don't know what actually happened. Mm-hmm, um, how do I navigate this conversation in a responsible way that allows both people's voices to be heard and doesn't lean one way or the other, but doesn't victim blame, but also allows like, you know, John to have his side of the story. Mm-hmm. It was really, really hard. And I honestly feel like after doing the interview with him, I don't feel like I did a good job. I don't feel like I you don't No, I don't, Why? Feel, I don't feel I challenged him enough. Um, I think I let a lot of, I feel like I let things slide. I feel like, I don't know. That's a hard one though, because I, I know what you're saying. Like even without saying it, like I, I can completely understand if, if it were me, I would feel like, and Stagliano, I think is a perfect example because he's someone I have, you can't be in porn and not have this like incredible amount of respect for John Stagliano. Like if, if anything, only on the level that he created gonzo porn, he is a legend. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know that I could sit there and like point my finger at him. Do you know what, I think it was, what it was, it was a really interesting intersection of the new generation and the old generation, the new generation Mm -hmm. and the me too movement and Mm -hmm. the advocacy for consent and boundaries and the old generation, which was just kind of like, well, this is porn. And like, this is because he didn't do anything like obscenely horrible to her. Mm -hmm. He just, I think groped her without her consent, which I could see, like, from his perspective, was kind of like, why is it such a big deal? But from her it's such perspective, a and I yeah. think, I think, I think for, I think if on paper this scenario, it, if heard by anyone who was not in the porn industry, mm-hmm. it's very black and white. I think yeah. to a non-porn insider, especially not from maybe 10 years ago. Like, I I think it's so obvious you don't grow people without consent. Like that's fucking obvious. But I think it's also like porn is, it's, it's really complicated because I think the conversation of consent is like, it's, it's not black and white in porn. It really, really isn't. Um, there's, it's it's just new to us. It's so new to us. And I think there's also something to be said for like in porn, like, for me anyway, like I consider like when I walk onto a porn set, like I'm trying to create chemistry, like not just with my male or female talent, but like with everyone on set, right? Like you're, you guys are all kind of, we're all like in this thing where we're trying to create this like chemistry and this like, almost like a forced intimacy kind of scenario so that we can make the best scene that we can. And I think that is, of course it's wrong to grope someone without consent, but it's like, but also, uh, it's like, to be so yeah, to be fair, I also just want to mention because I don't want um, to not like give his side of the story again. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, the what what he said was that that she was aware of what was going on. So again, mm-hmm. like, there's a situation like I don't was there a misunderstanding? Is one of you lying? Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? And these are not questions yeah. I necessarily want to ask or, or challenge you on, but. Yeah, I do think it was it was this this moment of like a really like a collision of the old and the new. And it reminded me of what you said when you think that like porn is the perfect job for like a small group of people and a horrible job for everybody mm-hmm. else. And I do not think like at all that porn is like a bad job for Ginger. Like she's done really, really well, but she's also like more of like an independent producer and she does a lot of her own stuff. And this was her first time working for a professional porn company. And so I think that's something we're seeing actually a lot is, um, and and maybe that's for the better, honestly, like, I don't know, like I'm at this point, I'm just like an old hag and like, (laughs) but like maybe, and perhaps it is for the better, but like, I think the people getting into porn now have grown up with different conversations. They've been educated differently. Yes. They are used to being their own producers and their own bosses. And we, Whereas like me, I got into porn and I would have done anything for porn. I just wanted to be in porn. You know what I mean? Like to me, like I wanted to like completely immerse myself in that world. And now it's, it's a little bit different. And I also think about like how, like, you know, I think you 
also have probably been through the scenario in porn a few times now where like, we do kind of have to, there are people who are our friends who've done things that are wrong. And it's like, at what, where do we draw that line? Like, of course, I always want to believe women and take a woman's side. I'm a woman, but like, I'm also like, I have friends that have been accused of horrible things and I don't know if it's true. Like it's, man, it's so well, hard. Well, that's the thing too. It's like, you have to be so careful these days about, you know, you know, this whole thing about like hashtag believe all women. Well, n- no, you can't believe all women because not all women, and women are human beings and not all human beings are reliable. Now, I believe most women, I don't know, because it's like, it, you know, you're trying to push back against this, this, you know, archaic, patriarchal, um, you know, situation where women were never believed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I'm sure you've been in this situation. I've been in this situation where I've been sexually harassed and mm-hmm. I've been put in a place where I feel like I can't say anything because I'm going to lose my job or, or mm-hmm. what. So I understand what it's like to be in that situation, but there's obviously always going to be unstable women who are going to unjustly accuse people, but we get caught up in this windstorm of like, you know, pushing so hard for women's rights and the me too movement that I think we forget like the great equalizer of all genders is that there's shitty people on both sides. Yeah, totally. Like there's just as many women liars as there are men liars. Right. right? Like I think, I think like that phrase is a little bit unfortunate, believe all women, because yeah. like you, I agree, we should not, it, in fact, it is in fact very unfeminist to say yes. believe all women um, because it's not equal, right? Right. I, I would like my, I wish my default were to believe women. Right. I guess is like as, is what I can say on that. <laughs> like I, I wish in a perfect world, my default would be to believe women. And like, I do strive toward that. Um, but there have been so many instances where I do have to like somehow reconcile the fact that like someone is my friend and someone is, they are also being accused of something like it's, it's so hard. It's, it's, and I think this is just, you know, these are the conversations that we have to have and these Mm -hmm. are the unfortunate situations that have to arise in order to enact change. And like Ginger Banks with, um, John Stagliano, like Emma Hicks with Jimmy Lifestyles, like all of these situations where, you know, women felt violated on a porn set, which I know like a lot of people are not surprised by that because like people believe that porn is, you know, violating anyhow, but you know, Mm -hmm. you and I know that, that we really try to cultivate in most sets one feels very safe on and, and hopes to feel safe on, but these things need to happen in order for us to recognize and and change them. And for me, like one of the greatest lessons about all of these, you know, consent and boundary violations that have come up is that I never really sat down and had performers talk about their do's and don'ts before they started the scene. Because for me, I thought like, Oh, you know, I don't really shoot hardcore stuff anyways, you know? So like, there's not going to be anything that happens that's going to, be something that's going to push a girl's boundaries. Um, you know, and, and as a woman, I can tell if a woman's uncomfortable. And so like, I can Mm -hmm. read the situation. So we don't need to have this talk, but I've realized that, that they do need to have this talk because there might be something that somebody is not necessarily like something that's really hardcore that happens on set, but it might be triggering to somebody for whatever reason, um, from some trauma they experienced in their past that I couldn't possibly know. And I just think that it's, it's a good conversation to have before you start to talk about your do's and your don'ts, because not only to like recognize what people, you know, definitely don't want to happen in the scene, but also to talk about what people like. Yeah. So people can like really try to have a great time. Like I love being kissed on my neck. So it just made me realize like the lack of communication that was on my set that I took for granted you know, didn't need to happen because I was a woman and I was running this ethical feminist set, you know what I'm saying? But also I think like, first of all, I think that's like fucking awesome that you're doing that and like, thank you. Um, but like, also I think, I think like it goes even deeper and 
for sure, these conversations do happen between performers, even like without the director, but it doesn't always happen. And I wouldn't even say it mostly happens. And I think, you know, like, I think women, a lot of us are raised to feel shame over sex in general, or to not really express what we want. And just because we're in porn, it doesn't mean that like, we're used to saying what we like, what we don't like. And I think, I I think like, that's just how women of our generation are programmed, you know, like, that's why we fake orgasms. That's why we don't tell a guy when he's eating our pussy, like totally wrong. (laughs) Um, Right? (laughs) Like, so I think, I think, when a third party, like a director can step in and force us to have that conversation, I think it is actually really appreciated. And I think that you are definitely cultivating a conversation that very likely would not have happened, Yeah, you know? And, and I don't think we shouldn't assume that people are comfortable to have that conversation on their own. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. Just because you work in the porn industry doesn't mean you're actually comfortable about sex. Totally. Totally. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That that's absolutely like just so fucking true. Who who do you think is your dream guest? Asa Akira, obviously. Stop it. You already had me, first of all. <laughs> no, but for real, like who is your Um Like do you have like a white whale? <laughs> uh I mean I interviewed Sasha Gray a little while ago, which was really cool. I wasn't expecting her to say yes. Uh-huh. Um, there's been a couple of girls that I really wanted to have on the show, but they said no. Okay. So, and I don't really want to call them out, but yeah. you've had them on your show. I'm just saying. <laughs> so that was disappointing. I, have to know. Um, <laughs> I think, um, do you think it's, 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 I've, I found that sometimes it's hard to get porn people to do things that for free. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, yeah. do you think that's? like the factor uh yeah maybe i mean one of them i don't know the no was through their agent and their agent could also oh. be lying because their agent does doesn't that. profit off of yeah them. so so it's possible that the no was actually not a no but mm-hmm. i don't have the balls to ask her directly because i don't want the last thing i want to do is be pushy you know what i mean like mm-hmm. i really recognize that when people come on my show they do it for free and they give me their time and they give me you know the promotion and it's it's it, i consider it an honor and i consider it a gift mm-hmm. and so i don't ever want people to think that i would try to pressure people into doing it because i recognize that everybody's time is important. And it's not like, I'm not Joe Rogan, you know what I mean? I'm not going to have millions of downloads. that's going to like change the trajectory of their career. Like if anything, especially if they're a bigger name, they're doing me a favor. So, you know, if they say no, I respect that. And I move on. I mean, the people that have said no to me, I've worked with them afterwards, like on set and things are totally cool. Like I don't bring it up. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're fine. Like I respect their decision. I understand it's a business decision and I don't take it personally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, maybe one day when I am getting a million downloads an episode, they'll say yes, but <laughs> well then I'm going to be happy that I got Asa Akira on. <laughs> so you're, so you're saying your dream guests are the people that said no. <laughs> it says something. What would I get have? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've wanted to have Kieran Lee on, which he said yes to finally over Zoom because I can't get him in the fucking studio. Um, just because he's hilarious and I think it would be a really funny interview. Um, I'm trying, I'm like racking my brain right now. I don't, I mean, there's a lot of people that I want to have on that I have. I finally got Phoenix Marie to agree love her that took me like two years <laughs> i i have i have um i actually have an episode in the can with her right now is that the right term yeah, yeah, in yeah, the can. yeah. like ready to go because we recorded pre-corona yeah um and oh my god she she's she's incredible because she will say anything she has like zero yeah. filter <laughs> that's what i love like girls like that or that's why like dana yeah. was so fucking hilarious yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah those are definitely like the kind of those are definitely end up being like the most fun kind of interviews when they're you're just like oh my god 
Am I in control of this or not? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What about you? Mm, For me, like my dream, I have two, I have two dream guests, but they're not specific people. I'm really, really dying to interview an asexual person. Mm, Okay. Um, even if it's like not for the podcast, I just yeah. want to like, want to I'm know. so curious about it and I know so little about it and mm. there's not a lot of information like on the internet about, yeah. you know, um, being asexual. So I'm really curious about that. And then I'm also like, you know, like I'm a performer and on Instagram, I, I have so many trolls, like just saying horrible shit to me every day. And I would love to interview a troll. I'm just trying to figure out like a safe way to do that. Cause you know, I mean, yeah, you don't know if you want to give them that attention, give them that attention or yeah. like my personal information <laughs> to like conduct yeah. an interview. Like, I don't know. So I'm, I'm definitely like trying to figure out a way where I can do that. So. I'd actually, you know, along those lines and I had somebody and then they kind of, I didn't follow up on it and now I really regret it, but I'd love to interview somebody who has like a really bizarre fetish that they like request weird custom videos for. Yeah. Actually, there's a guy who's asked me, I brought this up so many times on my podcast. There's a guy who's asked me several times if he can eat my shit. Um, He calls it uh, toilet treats. (laughs) And he's like several times. And every time he asks me, he like ups the rate. My last offer was 2,500. What? Yeah. And he said that all I do it? No. He said all I have to do is come to a hotel room and like shit in like a Oh, you have to do it in person. I don't know why. I was I was envisioning no, I don't have to. No, I don't Yeah, have to. I was envisioning you like shitting into a Ziploc bag and FedExing it to no, me. No, 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 no. So like what he wants me to do is he wants to rent a hotel room and he says like he'll wait in the lobby. Um so I don't ever have to meet him. And I just have to go like shit in like this silver bowl and pee in like this champagne flute. Cause he wants to like ha- make a very classy affair of it. Of and course. like, and he wants to drink my piss and eat my, my toilet treats like with a caviar spoon. And, um, Ugh, yeah, it's cab- very detailed. Forever. And, and I, and I like, maybe I should interview him and be like, why? Wow. Yeah, Holly, do you want that? You should interview him, and in, and in exchange for the interview, shit in the bowl for him. <laughs> it would be worth it. I don't know. I don't know if I can. It'll, be, it'll be the most preparation you've ever done for an interview. <laughs> oh my god. I actually prepared for this podcast. I ate a lot of chili last night. Oh my God. I always think about like, cause I'm, I'm pretty like, I'm pretty like down for anything, Yeah, but I can't wrap my head around the shitting thing. I yeah. like I'll pee on someone. Someone can pee on me. I can be into it. If, if they love it, like I can totally get into it, but shitting like, like, first of all, the smell. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get it either. And I, I also wonder too, like, I feel like he doesn't really eat it. I feel like he Why? just, I don't know. I just feel like he, he like, set, he like sets the table and like, just looks at it. I don't know. <laughs> I just feel like, cause it's like, how can you eat shit and not like throw up everywhere? Like your body would naturally reject that. Well, they have stomach problems. I know that. Like, well, okay. So I wait. Who is stomach I, people who eat? I, shit? I, I did, no, I'm not a shit eater, but I dated someone who was like into eating shit. Oh, and okay, I need to know. But I I couldn't. Just like no judging. Honestly, like whatever. Like if that's your kink, whatever. But like personally, not into it. And like I I just can't. I'm sorry. I just can't. Um. But he always had stomach problems. Well, yeah. I mean, so wait, he never ate your shit? Uh Uh-uh. And not only that, like, I always knew he was into shit. He's in the industry. I'll tell you who it is afterwards. But, like, he's in the industry. He, I knew beforehand he was into eating shit. And when we were, like, I wouldn't say we were, like, a couple, but we were, like, 
fucking off camera, I guess you could say. And he never asked me, but I know that he was like eating shit while we were hanging out. So he was eating other girls' shit. He was cheating yeah. on you by eating the shit of yeah. other girls. I mean, I wouldn't say cheating because, like, it wasn't, like... Can you imagine? Like, did he come home and was like, I know, what's that smell? You've been eating other girls' shit. What the fuck? <laughs> Why do you smell like shit? <laughs> Why do you smell like shit? You cheating <laughs> bastard. <laughs> but, like, I mean, yeah. And he, like, constantly had stomach problems. But... Yeah, I don't want to king shame either, but I, I I cannot wrap my head around that one either. That is, that is also yeah. like where do you think it starts? Because like okay, like now that I have a kid, I'm constantly thinking about like he'll come like tickle my feet or something, and he'll think it's hilarious. And of course, this is the most innocent thing ever. He's a toddler. But like, there is a part of me that's like, oh my god, like if I keep letting him do this, is he gonna? develop a foot fetish and it's not even a real thought it's just like a split thing in my head right like it's not like a real concern of mine but like which isn't a bad thing either no no, no, it's not even a bad thing but like I I just mean like that's like one of those things and like so I wonder like what where did he develop a shit fantasy (laughs) like yeah I mean that's the thing that's why I want to interview someone like this because I want to know it's got to stem from some kind of childhood trauma or childhood experience, you know, something imprinted on that person's brain at a young age. But do you think it has to be trauma? No, no, no. That's what I said. Childhood trauma or childhood experience. It doesn't, yeah. have to be, it has to be some kind of mo- like either monumental thing. I've also talked to people too, who just said that like something happened to them while they were in this like transitional moment where of sexual awakening, like a friend of mine, yeah. He was really into Asian women and he told me it was because he accidentally like walked in on his friend's mom changing who was Asian when he was like in puberty. And he thinks that like that ever since then, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like really crucial moment of sexual awakening. You have some experience that maybe. So what age is reaction? Huh? What age is that? Do you Uh, remember? Like probably like 10 or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. But as long as your kid doesn't develop a a, a shit eating fetish, I think you're fine. (laughs) I mean, no, you know what? Honestly, if he wants to eat shit, like that's fine by me. Wow. You really are a progressive mother. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean like, you know, whatever, like everyone's into something weird. That's okay. You're right. I, I feel like I'm in it. Like, I don't want to like harp on too much about how disgusting I think it is. Cause I feel like <laughs> people are going to come after me. No, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think it's fucking disgusting. <laughs> it's not. But also, I mean, is there nothing in the world left that we can make fun of Asa? Is there not <laughs> one kink that we can shame? I feel like if there's one that we can shame, it's shit eating. It's right? eating. I mean, must I be that accepting of everything? <laughs> Okay. Can I ask you some questions? Yeah. Do you miss performing and do you think you'll ever come back? Um, I, there are moments where I miss performing in like studio porn for sure. Um, and I think, I don't think I'll ever come back. I mean, never say never. And I don't even consider myself retired. Like I still shoot my own stuff from home and like, um, do you shoot I don't know that friend, or is it just solo? No, just me. And like, I, I just, I don't know that I can ever, I don't know that I have it in me to even like ever say I'm retired. Like, I just, I just don't know if maybe I do. I'm just not there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, when I, so I've been with my husband, I was with my husband when I was really, really young. Right. And then when we got back together this time, um, he was like not crazy about the idea of me being with other men or other people in general, actually. Um, and it's this weird thing of like, you know, I've been in porn for 12 years now. I've watched so many performers leave the industry for their partners, for their lovers, for their new relationships, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. And I always was like, oh man, that's lame. Like, do whatever you want. Like, you know, like if they're trying to control you, they're not for you. 
Um, but also something happened. Like, I don't know, like when I got with my husband this time, like, I just, I don't know. Like I, I love him so much. And to me, I got to do porn. Like I got to do the whole thing for 10 years. I got to be successful at it. I got so much out of it. And it was, you know, I'm so lucky. Like I had such a lucky, lucky career. And for me, like at that point in my life, it was more important to me to continue a relationship with my husband than it was to continue shooting porn. And Mm -hmm. I think that's something that like, I really didn't understand until it happened to me. Like I really, really truly believe that it was like unfeminist to quit shooting porn for a man. Like I really, really thought that. And I, I think a lot of people, a lot of people I know, you know, still feel that way. And I think for me now I'm like, well, no, like I, I made a choice based on like what I want for my life at that time. And I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. I don't feel like, um, I don't feel like I'm missing anything in my life now. Like I'm still shooting. I'm still in the industry. I still get to like enjoy a lot of the things about the industry. So for me, like it was a decision I made that was worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm, I I can also recognize that I've been really lucky to be able to say that it's been worth it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think that's also not a privilege. Like, people have all the time but but for me it was worth it and well look I think there's a difference between getting together with a man who's trying to really control you and Mm -hmm. say like I don't want you shooting porn because you know x y and z I'm, I'm ashamed of your career or whatever and like just being somebody who's only interested in a monogamous relationship Mm -hmm. like look this is what I need like mm-hmm. I need to have a monogamous relationship. And if that's not what you want, then this isn't going to work out rather yeah, than you need to quit porn for totally. me. And that's exactly what it was. Like, even, you know, when we started hanging out, he was very much like, Hey, just so you know, like if we're going to take this further, like this is what I need out of a relationship. And, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, so, so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see. I mean, I'm I'm also in the camp of like never say never, which is I think also why it's always really hard for me to ever say use a word like retirement. Because obviously we Yeah, we've seen so many porn stars we've retire. Seen, yeah. Oh my god. And like, is there I, I've always thought like, oh man, there's like nothing worse than making like that huge press release announcement, um, video, everything where you're like, I'm retired and then yeah. It, it just makes it this like weird thing to come back. So like you couldn't make it out in the real world. Yeah. You know? So yeah. for me though, like I don't know that I'll ever be I think I'm like porn for life, you know? Like so would you ever like shoot solos? Maybe. Um, but also like right now, like you know, it's kind of like all the way back to what we were saying before is like I've gotten really, really comfortable in my life. Like I get to work from home, you know, I get to be a stay at home mom, um, while also having the benefits of having a job. And like, to me, that's like, that's been pretty priceless. And, you know, people ask me all the time, like, what's the number that you would shoot a scene for? Like, what's the price? And like, I can honestly say right now I would not shoot a scene for a billion dollars. And that's like, it's true. Like right now I'm comfortable. I'm happy. Like that's, to me, that's yeah, you don't need it. You don't need the money. Mm-hmm. So, um, how has, has having a child changed the way that you see porn or your role in porn? Are you ever worried about when your kid finds the work that you've done? Are you concerned about like having that conversation? Yeah, I'm <laughs> so worried. I mean, that's why I was like asking you about you and your mom. Mm. Um, you know, like I, I, I am worried. I am anxious for that conversation. And I think about it all the fucking time and having a kid has changed the way I look at porn, but like, not in a way that I'm like regretful that I did it at all. Now I'm like, I feel if anything, like I feel almost spiteful. Um, if that makes sense, like it angers me that I have these thoughts 
Mm-hmm. And it angers me that I've been like raised in a society and even like live currently in a society where like I have to like think about how to break to my child what I do for a living. Yeah. Yeah. And, no, I hear you. you and know- I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm happy. I love my job. I think I find it personally so empowering that I've been able to live my adult life the way I've wanted to. And so it, it's kind of like infuriating. Yeah. I will say just from like my personal perspective, I know my mom never like acted in porn, but you know, like obviously she shot it and clearly she's fucked porn stars like Mr. Marcus. <laughs> Maybe, allegedly. Maybe allegedly we are going to find out. I'm going to ask her and I will repeat I will, I will say this. And that's a rumor. terrible fucking liar, too. So if she tries to lie to me, I will know. I will be able to read it on her face. So it is I will the like, word on the street. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, the way that man like fucking smooth talks her. But anyways, um, what I realized is that I meant to tell you earlier, and then I got off on this fucking tangent of like my mom and the book that she was writing. So when she went on that tour for that book that I mentioned earlier, she did all of these interviews. And the sexism that she came up against with these male journalists that interviewed her, you know, back in the seventies was just like, so eye opening. And there's this one interview in particular, and I will send it to you because I think it's on my YouTube channel and I'll post it in the comments guys. Um, if I can find it, it was for a current affair in Australia. And what's so interesting too, is that she gave birth to me like a year after she did this interview and I'm the eldest child. So right after she had this conversation, um, I was conceived and then she, she gave birth to her first child and the interviewer asked her, um, you know, what are your children going to think of you when, you know, they grow up and they know that mommy wrote this salacious book about all these people that she slept with and all the things that she did. And like, what are your grandchildren going to think about, you know, granny behaving in such a manner? And she was so like kind of taken aback, but also like angry about the question. And she said, and he's like, what kind of morals are you going to teach your children? That's what he said as well. And she said, I'm going to teach my children what any mother should teach their children. I'm going to teach them to be kind and be responsible and always tell the truth. She's like, what else would you teach your children? You know, like, um, how dare you, suggest that I can't raise a child yeah. because what I do for a living. And then that's when he asked like, well, what are your grandchildren going to think, you know, about you when they find out about this book? And she goes, when my grandchildren grow up this, it's going to be a different world. We're not going to live in a place where we're going to judge people based on the fact that, you know, they had a good time when they were young. We're not going to be so hung up on sex. My grandchildren aren't going to give a damn if their granny went and had a great time, you know, when she was in her, um, youth. And it's just so interesting to watch that interview now as her daughter, And knowing that, you know, she did raise me really well and I had a wonderful childhood and she taught me all of these, you know, values and morals that I think that I I try to, to encompass and that she, you know, I think my grandchildren won't care about what she did. Yeah. I know I don't. So it was just like, it's really interesting kind of premonition that she had in this interview and I don't know. I just love it. So I'll send you the link. It's really awesome. It's really cool. It's cool to see the way that society wanted to paint her into this box. Yeah. She just refused to fit into it and how she ended up, you know, being a wonderful mother, despite the fact that she works in porn. Yeah. And that reminds me of a really, uh, I saw you posted on Instagram, something that I really loved recently where you said like, I can't remember exactly what it was, but something like, um, I love being a whore and like swallowing a lot of cum or something like that and doing all these dirty sex acts, but I'm also like a responsible and loving mother and I can be both Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Um, I know I totally just misquoted you, but. No, it's basically that. Like, I I think what I was just trying to say is that like, I love being a whore, Mm -hmm. but I'm also a really good mom. I think so far I'm loving, I'm responsible. Um, and those things can co coexist, right? Like it's exactly. And I think I would even add to that now. Like, I think like there's this weird thing where like, we don't allow women to be sluts and mothers and business women. Mm-hmm. Like, 
none of those things can cross over in a Venn diagram. Like even a businesswoman and a mother, kind of like what we were saying before, yeah. right? Or a businesswoman and a slut or a slut and a mother. Like it's it's just none of those things can cross. And it's like, and yet it's totally like in us to be all of those things. Like it's all three of those things are like, can totally exist in a woman and are completely natural. So I think it's just, I, I wish, I, I think so. Yeah. Like to answer your question, like I do see porn differently and I, I see it more now, like almost like I feel it as like a, a mission where I'm like, I need to continue doing what I want to do despite what society may think I should not be doing as a mother. Um, yeah. And I should continue to make my own decisions and live my life how I want to and make decisions based on how I will be happier. Um, it just, I, I think that's even more important to me now than ever. And also I have a son and like for what it's worth, like I just, I really want to raise a boy, a man that sees a woman like living life on her own terms. Like that's yeah. really important to me. Yeah. Like, I don't want him to question that. Right. I totally agree with you. I, yeah, this idea that society, you know, it's like the mother or the whore complex. It's like, you can only be mm -hmm. one or the other. And, and that woman, you know, can be multidimensional and they can be an openly sexual person and they can be also really intelligent and they can also be really creative and they can be funny and they can be, um, empathetic and they can be, you know, they can be so many things. And I just feel like, you know, in terms of like true feminism, the idea of, of breaking past like those sex barriers, I think is like the kind of the final, the final push that we need to like really get women out there as like one whole being that can be all these different things. Do you feel differently now that you're pregnant? Like, do you see porn differently? You know what? I, I, I don't, but I also like, I don't really feel differently, like in general being pregnant. I don't, feel like much of a connection to my child yet because mm -hmm. I still don't really feel pregnant. Um, you know, seeing obviously the sonogram was like really moving and, um, I don't know, I think until I have the child and I don't know like how, how you felt, but I don't really feel connected to the baby yet. I love that you're saying that. <laughs> Is that bad? I feel like I should, but I just don't. I just, I felt really guilty actually. Like throughout my whole pregnancy, I didn't feel any kind of connection. Like I had, it's kind of like you said, I had those moments where like I would get a sonogram and like my breath would be taken away. Yeah. And like, you know, um, I had a lot of moments, but like overall it kind of felt like very surreal. And like, as if I was thinking about someone else having a baby. Yeah. Um, and then when I had him, I was like, I, I remember like holding him for the first time. And like, I, of course, like I did feel like this immediate love, but I didn't, it wasn't, it, it felt like I got a puppy. <laughs> it felt like I got like, you know what I mean? Like you get a puppy and you love it right away. And they're like the cutest thing ever. And you want to take a hundred photos of it. But like, it wasn't, I didn't feel like a lot of people are like, oh, you know, the instant I laid my eyes on my baby, I knew my life was different and I had yeah. never felt love like that before. For me, it wasn't like that. Like I grew to feel that way, but it took a couple months. Like, yeah, I feel like that's going to be the same way for me too. Is it, and isn't it funny that we feel like we have to be apologetic about the way that we feel? Totally. But that's why I love that you said that because like, I think I, I feel like if I feel like that, if you feel like that, like more women probably feel like that. We just feel like we're not fucking allowed to say that because it's, yeah. it's not old, but. Well, because having a child is supposed to be like the pinnacle of our existence and often like the only reason for it, you know, like totally. our main purpose is just to be a vessel to bear children. And if right. you feel like you've achieved like the most monumental thing in your life by getting pregnant, then like, are you really a woman? And it's like. Right. I just don't feel that way yet. I'm sure when I have, you know, the baby, I, I will. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's the thing. Like, I don't know how I'm going to feel, but I don't I don't think I'm going to really change my mind. I mean, considering, you know, the family I grew up in and. Right. You know, my already, mom, your mentality is already different. Yeah. yeah. My, my mom continued. I mean, my birth was announced in Hustler magazine. So. Stop. <laughs> 
I'm so jealous of your life. <laughs> There's actually a picture that they staged of me on a sling nursing while my mom's shooting. And we want to recreate that picture. Uh, you know when like there should be a word for like when you are so intensely jealous of something that like was never a- attainable to you anyway? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you ever get like really jealous? Like you'll see someone else like make a movie and it's like totally not even the kind of movie you would ever make, but mm-hmm. you get like intensely jealous. I don't know if that happens to you. That happens to me all the time. And like, there should be a word for that. Like, I wish, I wish I had the kind of upbringing where I could recreate a photo like that. But you can, you know, you, never can be, you can be that parent to your son. Yeah. You know, and yeah. you can change his, you know, you can have a child who sees the adult world and porn and sex and women differently than other people. Though, you know, let's hope that as the generations continue, that they will become more and more progressive and more open to ideas of sexuality and women and porn. So, you know, and, mm-hmm. and gosh darn it, Asa, by you and me having podcasts like this, we're changing the world one episode at a time. We're doing our part. <laughs> <laughs> this is our gift to you, world. This is our <laughs> gift to you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> someone's got to do it, you know? <laughs> someone's got to do it. And apparently that someone's got to be us. <laughs> but I mean, that's the cool thing about podcasting too, though, that I just realized is like, that I just thought of actually is like, you can totally do it up until the day you give birth. And yeah, short chapter two. Like it's, yeah, it's pretty like. I'll probably bank a bunch of episodes before mm-hmm. I go into the hospital because I've heard that I will be very tired. So you know, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. The first couple months like fly by because you're so tired. Ta- they fly by in the slowest way because you're so tired. Yeah. What do you think the greatest gift about podcasting has been for you, or what's like the greatest lesson that you've learned? That's a really good question. Um, I think, I think one thing I'm like continuing to learn is that like, if you talk to someone like long enough and if you can ask the right questions and get enough of a background on someone, they're impossible to dislike. So does that mean that you finally like me now? <laughs> I'm How always like longer does this show need to go for it? So you like me. <laughs> you're 30 minutes away from that. No, I'm kidding. But like, no, for real. Like I, I really do now believe that like, like I've gone into interviews, um, especially like I've gone into interviews where like, I felt like I had to interview someone and maybe Mm -hmm. perhaps I wasn't so interested in them personally. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, by the time I'm done talking to them for like an hour or two hours or whatever it is, it's like, Oh, like they are actually a very interesting person. I, I I do enjoy talking to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've definitely. Mm Hmm. What, no, I was just saying, like, turning the question back on you. Oh, like, um, yeah, because I totally didn't ask you that question because I wanted you to ask me the same. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but, yeah, for me, it's been just, like, an incredibly eye-opening experience where I get to sit down and talk to somebody for an extended period of time without, like, looking at my phone. Um, I feel like it's made me a better listener. It's made me a better communicator. And it's definitely opened my eyes to see things in a different way. I feel like it really brought me a lot of perspective on things that I wouldn't have thought about or understood before. Um, you know, from the few trans performers that I've interviewed, it's been a really great experience understanding like, you know, what they're going through. Um, it's giving me a lot more compassion for people. Uh, like a great example, it, it, it's changed my biases that I've had. You know, I've had some in, internal biases that I didn't really realize I had until Mm -hmm. these people like a great one is Michael Vegas. You know, I had Michael Vegas on and I've always felt that like men who like to be pegged were like kind of effeminate and that it was this, you know, um, you know, kind of, I don't know, submissive thing on the, on the behalf of the man. And that, you know, it was, I don't know, just all these ideas of, Mm -hmm. of what 
I believed pegging a man would be. And, you know, from talking to Michael, who's not a submissive man in any way, I don't know if you've ever mm-hmm. worked with him, but mm-hmm. he's an incredibly yeah. strong performer. And I wouldn't say he's like effeminate. I mean, he's definitely got like a really interesting style, but I would never like say that Michael's like an effeminate feminine man, um, he really kind of changed my mind about how I see men who enjoy being pegged and who enjoy female play. And I thought, you know, wow, I really do have these entrenched like gender role biases about men's roles in the bedroom. And Michael really helped open my eyes to looking at that a different way, which I just felt was really valuable. It's also not like, not for nothing, but like, it's not our fault. I think that we have these internal biases. I yeah. think it's, I think it's our responsibility to like educate ourselves and become better and, you know, become more empathetic, like as we get older and more informed, but like, I don't think like, these are ideas, like ex- everything you said is like what society has put in our heads that like men who like to be penetrated are weak. Right. 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 Because it's feminine, probably. Right. It's probably like the root of it, right? Right. But like, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And like kind of on that note too, like I think another thing I've really learned from podcasting for this long is like I've really learned that like changing your mind is an option. Yeah. Because there are so many things I've said publicly on a podcast, on my podcast, on another podcast, whatever, that like I totally don't feel that way anymore. And I think like allowing myself like the luxury of being like, sorry, changed my mind or, you know, I got better educated and now I don't feel that way anymore. I think that's okay and important that like that is normalized. Yeah. Yeah, It's, you know, um, I watched, I don't know if you've seen this and if you haven't, you should check it out. Um, there's a new documentary on the beastie boys, which is excellent. And they, and Ad Rock said something, which I thought was really cool. No one else told me about this quote. Okay. Is it, um, that, so someone was interviewing him because, you know, I'd rather be a hypocrite than somebody who never changes. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that quote. I was like, that's so true because, you know, that's what it means to be a human being. And that's what it means to be progressive is that we can change our minds. We don't, we aren't born with the right ideas. We right. aren't born with like this knowledge and this We're understanding of any world. information. Yeah. yeah. And some of us are, are fed the wrong information for a long time. Yeah. And I think the greatest thing about human growth is the ability to change your mind and to see that you are wrong and look at things in a different way. And I just feel like that should be something that people are more open about. Yeah, completely. Yeah. I'm with so. you. All right. This has been awesome. Do you have any more we questions? For so to? Long, Holly. <laughs> Two and a half hours. I know my husband finally got home and he's like, fuck it. I'm cooking. You guys can end the podcast. I don't know if you can hear the sink in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I've, we've wanted to do this for so long and I'm so glad we made it happen. Me too. Me too. Um, where can everybody find you on social media? Uh, I'm Asa Akira on Twitter, Asa Hall on Instagram and pornhubpodcast.com for the podcast. And what about yourself? <laughs> Well, I'm Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And my website is hollyrandallandfilter.com. I also love how you take your hair and you give yourself a mustache. <laughs> you're like embarrassed about something or like um, you find something amusing. You do this. I, so this is something my husband points out and he always knows that I have a crush on a guy or think a guy's cute if I start doing like this. <laughs> and touching my hair and like playing with my hair on my face. So oh my God, that's great. Um, I guess I have a crush on you. <laughs> oh, well, it only took two and a half hours of the conversation <laughs> to get you to finally like me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this, this was really cool. It's really interesting to be like both a host and a guest. Yeah, I know it. Ha- yeah, it has been interesting. I, I don't know if I talked more about myself or asked you more questions about you, but I feel like we did a good job of 
Both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't worry. The people on my YouTube comments will let me know. Well, let me know when they let you know, and maybe I can interview them about being a troll. <gasps> oh my God. I have so many trolls on my fucking YouTube channel. You this whole no thing idea. has been a trap for trolls. It's been a <laughs> casting call. <laughs> There's, it's actually really interesting because I don't know if you have like a YouTube channel at all in any other capacity, but it's like its own thing. And there's been literally like full on arguments and conversations in the comments that have like developed into their own thing. Do you read your comments? Oh, yeah. I used to read every single thing and now I don't. And you know, you know, it was like mostly because people will sometimes say really horrible things about my guests, about other people. And I don't want my guests to read that. Yeah. Um, also too, sometimes you get some weird stalkers who will post like my guests, like legal name. Oh, number. Yeah. So I just got to kind of keep an eye on it for that. So my, my, I used to read everything and my therapist told me this one really cool thing that like, I try to pass on to like every public person or anyone who gets mean comments. And like, she said to me once, like, if you're, if all these things were written about your friend, would you read it to them? Yeah. And I was like, absolutely fucking not. Cause it would hurt their feelings. And she was like, so why do you, why do you hurt yourself like that? And I was yeah. like, that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll stop, but I do. I no, think I'm not even saying stop. Just like for me, that was yeah, an aha thing. Yeah. No, I hear you. All right. Awesome. Yay. This has been so much fun. Um, so I guess we set our exits and yes. I guess we say, we say our goodbyes now. I like, don't know how to wrap this up. I know it's so weird. Wrap really- you wrap this up. Like who's in charge? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. <laughs>